everyone. Welcome to our cataract webinar. My name is Melissa Casanova and I'm a physician liaison at Virginia Eye Institute. We have the pleasure of being here today to chat with one of our lovely surgeons, Dr. Tucker. Um, we are excited that you're here joining us this afternoon and we have some really good info to share. Um, this webinar will be recorded and sent out yeah. after to everyone and we'll also be added to our website in case you miss anything. Um, please mute, mute yourself during the duration of this recording. Um, and if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can submit them through the chat. And once Dr. Tucker is done with his presentation, he'll go through and answer all of them. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So with that, Dr. Tucker, um, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, great, thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name's uh, Steve Tucker. I'm one of the comprehensive and refractive surgeons at the Virginia Eye Institute. Um, I've been here for about three years now. I uh, was previously at Emory University down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia before that for all of my eye training. Um, but really here today to talk to you about cataracts and cataract surgery. It's one of the things we specialize in here at the Virginia Eye Institute and uh, look forward to, to sharing some information with you. Feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, last time I did this, um, people liked using the chat feature and just asking questions in that chat box. Um, if you'd rather unmute and ask me a question, that's perfectly fine too. Uh, so let me pull up the talk and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so let me just put this in presenter mode and we'll get started. All right, is everybody seeing the, seeing that okay? And I'll pull up the chat in the corner. If someone can just respond to the chat and say that uh, they can see the screen, we'll get started. I just wanna confirm that everybody can see that. I can see it. Okay, you can? Yes. Okay, great. All right, yeah, it looks, perfect. It looks like a title slime. That's exactly right, perfect. All right. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about cataract surgery, advanced technologies and just cataracts in general. All right, and so we're gonna cover a lot of information. We're gonna talk about cataracts, what they are, what the symptoms are, how common they are, and what we can do for them. We'll talk about the different methods of cataract surgery removal, as well as preoperative testing and the different lens options available. Uh, like I said, if there are any questions as we go through a certain topic, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, a lot of people save their questions for the end. Either way works for me. All right, so let's talk about the basics. A cataract is a clouding of the natural lens of the eye. The lens focuses the light on the retina, kind of like a camera. Um, when we talk about cataracts and cataract surgery, I, I like to use the analogy of a, of a peanut M&M to describe kind of the anatomy of what the lens is like. So um, there's a candy shell, which is the, the outer layer. Then there's chocolate, which is kind of a, a milky layer. And then there's the peanut, which is the hard nucleus of the cataract. And so I'll, I'll use that analogy a few times throughout, but that peanut M&M analogy can be really helpful in understanding the surgical part of cataracts. Uh, so, but again, a cataract is simply a cloudy lens in the eye. Another term that patients frequently ask about and have questions about is stigmatism. Astigmatism is a focusing error that can result in blurred vision. Uh, I typically talk to patients about this as a cornea, which is the outermost layer of the eye being shaped like a football instead of a basketball. So if it's a perfect sphere, all of the light will focus in one at one point. And that's someone that doesn't have astigmatism, that has a perfectly round front surface. Astigmatism, um, again, if you picture the football, you've got the short end and the long end. So you get the light focusing on two different points. And that's why you need glasses or a lens to correct the astigmatism if you don't wanna have blurred vision. 
Uh, intraocular lens. Uh, a common question is, are you going to put a lens in or did you put a lens in? Um, during surgery, when you take the cut, you have to put a new lens in. If you don't put a new lens in, you won't see well. So that is part of standard cataract surgery is to, again, take that cloudy lens out and put a clear one in. So what are the symptoms of cataract? That's probably the second most common question I get. Uh, what will I notice if my cataract's bothering me? Well, the first thing that you may notice is a myopic shift or a change in your glasses prescription. So as that lens changes in thickness and changes in opacity, it can cause the prescription to change. So you may see each time you see your doctor that the prescription's changing or getting more nearsighted. Sometimes this will work to someone's advantage where they actually get what's called second sight, where they don't need readers anymore because of this myopic shift. Um, but that can be an early sign of cataract. Glare and nighttime driving difficulties are probably the most common symptom we see where when that oncoming light, headlight comes at you, just blinds you and scatters the light and makes it very difficult to see. Uh, so glare and halos at nighttime are probably the most common symptom. Faded colors, um, you know, the, the lens kind of turns a yellowish brown and so it's very common for colors to be, not be as vibrant or as good. Now I will say in my experience, most patients notice the color change after the surgery. So they say, wow, I, I can't believe how much I wasn't seeing, um, but they uh, don't necessarily notice it until afterwards. Difficulty in dim light settings. Another very common description is I'm having trouble reading my book at night without lots of light on or extra lights on compared to normal. Light sensitivity. Um, it doesn't just have to be at night. It can be from the sun during the day. Uh, with bright lights, because again, the same type of concept where the light scatters through that cloudy lens. And then just blurred or general decrease in vision. There are other um, specific symptoms that you can have. It can cause increased pressure and, and different things as well, but these are the most common. All right, so let's talk about what you can do for cataracts. So when you have mild cataracts, doing nothing or changing your glasses prescription is all you need to do. So if we can get you seeing well with an updated glasses prescription, then, then that's all you have to do. It reaches a point though where the glasses don't help or they don't correct these symptoms. And that's when we start talking about cataract surgery. So those are really the, the three things you can do. Observe, update the glasses, or talk about cataract surgery. So let's talk about the risks. When we talk about surgery, we talk about the risks, benefits, and alternatives. That's what we do in medicine. And so let's start with the risks. Overall, cataract surgery is very safe. It's very common, um, but there are risks just like with any other surgery that you do. And risks include infection. That's very rare. Uh, posterior capsular rupture, uh, that is where that candy shell, uh, again, so with surgery, you take out the peanut, you take out the chocolate and you leave the candy shell in place. That candy shell is where we put the new lens. Now that candy shell is only about a hundredth of an inch thick. So there is a small chance that during the surgery that that candy shell opens um, and some of the lens could fall or there could be other issues. And that's what's called a posterior capsular rupture. Again, not very common at all, but again, something that we are trained to deal with if there ever was that issue. Certain uh, patients can be at a higher risk of that. If you've had retina surgery or injections or, or trauma, uh, some of those can be higher risk. But again, uh, we know how to handle that as well. Intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Again, uh, not something you necessarily need to worry about, but basically if you take Flomax, Tamsulosin, or similar medications, it can cause your iris to uh, not stay can not stay dilated, it can constrict and get kind of floppy, and that's called intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Again, we know how to deal with that. Zonulopathy, there are little fibers all the way around the lens that hold it into place. And those zonules, or what they're called, can be weak. They can be weak from trauma. They can be weak from a condition such, such as pseudoexfoliation um, or, or just genetics, but, um, that's something else that we're always on the lookout for and, and take care of at the time of surgery. And then I always say there's always that potential need for additional surgery if there's an issue or if there's, uh, you know, something happens or that we need to do. So let's talk about the benefits of cataract surgery. So the main benefit is so you can see better. 
Um, in order to qualify for cataract surgery, you have to have a visual or functional complaint. So the most common functional complaint we get is, I don't feel safe driving at night, or my vision is not as clear as I want it to be, or, you know, I'm having trouble threading the needle when I'm sewing. You know, all these different things are functional complaints. Um, and, you know, you can't just say, I don't want to wear glasses. You know, it has to be a functional complaint. Uh, but, you know, some of the things that decreased vision can affect, uh, and this is from the essentials of cataract surgery, but vision worse in 2025, as simple as a one or two line decrease in vision has been associated with more falls and fractures. Uh, worse in 2040 vision, which is a cutoff for driving, uh, driving uh, unrestricted license, um, you know, can affect mobility, activities of daily living and physical performance. And then even worse in 2050, which isn't that bad, there's a greater worse of impaired visual field, risk of death and motor vehicle accidents. So as everyone knows, vision is very important and maintaining that vision is important. And that's why we do what we do for you. All right, so let's talk about cataract statistics. Cataracts are super common. So basically everyone, you know, if you live long enough, you're gonna develop cataracts and at some point, they'll, they'll likely start impacting the vision. Um, so 20.5 million Americans over age 40 have cataracts. Um, approximately 4 million cataracts are done each and every year. Um, by and large, people feel like their vision improves significantly after cataract surgery. Um, with cataract surgery, about half of patients have significant astigmatism with that cataract. And again, we'll talk about that when we talk about the lens options. Um, and everyone develops presbyopia as well. Presbyopia is, you know, the need for reading glasses as you age, as the lens stiffens. And many people have cataract astigmatism and presbyopia. And um, the lenses they've developed today can help with some or all of those conditions. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. So now let's talk about, the, if anyone has questions about symptoms or what to look for, I'm happy to answer those. Otherwise, we'll talk about surgery next. Uh, we'll start with anesthesia. That's a, a common question or concern patients have, is they're worried about having someone touch and operate on their eye. Um, so there are different ways of doing anesthesia. Um, general anesthesia, where you completely go to sleep, is very rare in cataract surgery. Uh, we only do that in patients that have significant intellectual disabilities, significant head tremor where they're not able to keep their head still, you know, things like that. Otherwise, you will be awake during surgery, okay? They will give you medicine through the IV to keep you relaxed. It's called monitored anesthesia care. Um, on top of that, there's a couple other things we do. So uh, the most common way I do it is called local or topical, where you get the medicine through the IV to keep you relaxed. Sometimes you'll doze off, but for the most part, you're, you're, you're awake. Um, but we use numbing drops and numbing medicine in the eye to keep you completely numb so you don't feel anything. Um, there's what's called a retrobulbar block. A retrobulbar block is where you, you, uh, the anesthesiologist will uh, inject medicine behind the eye to paralyze the eye so you don't feel anything, you don't have to worry about the eye moving, things like that. I don't do that very commonly. I do that in about 5% of cases, 5 to 10% of cases. I'm always willing to do it if a patient would like that. I consider it a little more invasive because again, they have to you know, inject medicine behind the eye. And so there are a few potential complications with that. And that's why I tend to avoid it again, unless we need to. If someone says that, you know, I'm super light sensitive and I get a feel for that during your preoperative evaluation, whether that's something you need, but every doctor does things a little bit different. There's some doctors that primarily do the block. Um, and again, that's surgeon preference, but you know, those are the two main options. Uh, there is a difference in, in uh, going home between the two. So with the local or topical, you go home with a shield that has holes in it. So you can see through that even that day. Um, with a block, you go home with a patch. And so you, you do not see through that on, on the day of surgery. So the surgery itself, once we start, only takes about 15 minutes. Um, of course, there are exceptions if it's a very complex or very dense lens or there are any issues that can take longer. But on average, 10 to 20 minutes is how long the surgery itself takes. Um, and um, in terms of medicines, we'll talk about that next. Um, there are some drops you use after the surgery. Uh, typically, in, in again, just to be clear, 
everything I'm telling you today is, is my experience and the way I do things. Every doctor does things slightly different. So the medications may be slightly different. The anesthesia may be slightly different, et cetera. But I'm, I'm kind of giving you an overview of everything that, that, that's an option in, in the way I do it. Um, so typically a doctor will take it, have you take an antibiotic, a steroid, and an anti-inflammatory drop. Um, so some doctors will prescribe two or three different bottles for this. Uh, some doctors use compounded drops, which we'll talk about. A compounded drop simply means that all the, the drops are put into one bottle. And then there are different injectables that we can use. Antibiotics, which we'll occasionally inject at the time of surgery, depending on whether we think it's indicated. And there are different steroid uh, implantations that you can do as well. So again, uh, you can use three different bottles for the different drops. Um, I have switched to using a compounded drop, which puts all three of those, the antibiotic, the steroid, and the anti-inflammatory drop, all into one bottle. Um, we use a compounding pharmacy. They're actually based in Montana. Uh, they're the biggest compound, ophthalmic or eye compounding uh, group in the country. And so that's who we use or who I use. Um, and so uh, this bottle you get, it's, I think it's $40 to get this rather than getting the three separate bottles, which sometimes can be more expensive than, than getting the compounded drops. But again, you always have the option. So uh, we offer this to everybody. And if they want to go with the uh, three bottles, they, they can. But uh, this is what I prefer. I feel like it's easier for patients. All right, Dextenza. This is another uh, thing that, that, that's a possibility for each patient. It's where we put a little steroid implant in your tear drainage system. And so this goes in the corner. Uh, it's not visible and it completely dissolves after about 30 days. So what this does is it gives off steroid for a full month. And so that way you can stop the drops after a week instead of slowly tapering off the drops over the course of the month. On average, if you don't do this, you do the steroid, the combination drops for four times a day for one week, then three times a day in the second week, twice a day in the third week, and then once a day in the fourth week. So you slowly come off of it. But if you use something like Dextenza, then the steroid slowly goes away over the month and, and you stop the drops after one week instead of after four weeks. So this is just a picture. Uh, can, I ask, of what... can, I ask, sure. can I ask a question about um, the steroid that you just mentioned, the last option for medication? Uh -huh. uh, why would you not use that ever? Uh, so that's a great question. So there's a couple of reasons. So for instance, Someone that is a uh, high eye pressure that is predisposed to spikes in pressure from steroids. So some people that have what's called steroid response glaucoma, um, someone like that, you, you wouldn't do it in. Um, there's a uh, financial implication to Dextenza as well. So uh, for people that have Medicare with the secondary, it's 100% covered. Um, for others, there, there can be co-pays. And so we, we talk about that, and, and that's a factor for each patient as well, because um, you know, there, there's a cost concern as well. So for patients with Medicare and secondary, most of the time they, they do it. And for, for the others, it, you know, it, it's a personal decision. Okay. All right. So any other questions on medications before we go to the next one? And also, you know, with Dextenza, again, these are offerings and this is how I, I do my surgeries and, and what we do. Every doctor is a little different in, in what they do and what the options are. So um, not everyone does Dextenza, for instance. And, um, you know, so it's kind of a surgeon preference on it as well. I've got a question. Sure. Whoops. I've lost you. Um, the Dextenza, does it have to be removed from the um, tear duct? Or no, does it, it, dissolve? It, it, it dissolves on its own and goes okay. away. So okay. over the course of a month, it reabsorbs and goes away. Okay. Moving on to the next thing I, I go over with patients is we talk about the way I say it is there's kind of two ways we can do the surgery. This is a common question. Is my surgery going to be done by laser? Um, so there, there are what I call two ways of doing it. There's standard manual incision surgery where everything is done by hand. And there's laser assisted cataract surgery where the laser does the precision cuts or basically the cuts for the, for the surgery. And so um, this is information from Alcon where they talk about the precision and the predictability and the customization. I'll kind of talk through it here on the, so this is a picture of the laser. And so what you'll see is you can use the laser to, 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 
show where the cuts are going to go. You can see how thick the lens is. Um, you can it can it makes the circle on top of that candy shell it divides the lens into quadrants to make it easier to remove. So this is an option. It is a um, tool we can use during surgery to do certain parts of the surgery. So the laser doesn't do everything. We still need to take the lens out and put the new one in, but it basically does all the cuts for us. Um, and so this is an option. Um, I tell patients that I do surgery both ways. I do a lot of surgery with the laser. I do a lot of surgery without the laser. Um, it's an individual decision for each patient, depending on which technology you want. Um, again, same question as the Dextenza. The big implication here is there, there is an extra charge. It's not covered by insurance for us to utilize the laser. Um, and uh, when you come in for your cataract evaluation, you know, they'll go over all the potential costs for any of these, these uh, devices or equipment as well. So again, just showing in more detail uh, what, the, again, this isn't my, uh, uh, one of my cases, but basically you'll see um, that circle on top of the lens is, is you can, you know, when we do it manually, we use a little needle to, to, to open up that capsule in a circle, kind of like tearing saran wrap, and we're really good at it. Um, but the laser can also do it and kind of offer a, a perfect 360 capsule rexus. And you can see these two uh, yellow squares. Can you see where my mouse is? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so that is where the laser makes the incision. So you can say exactly where you want the incisions to go. And then over here, we'll show where the cuts are actually going from the laser. Um, and then again, you see, you can see how thick the lens is and these different things as well. So it offers some advanced diagnostics at the time of surgery as well. Um, and also the main the, the main utilization of it is actually for the correction of astigmatism. So um, you can create, you can uh, uh, treat low levels of astigmatism with the laser as well to minimize that prescription as well. So that's, that's the laser. Um, a a qu question about the laser? Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned there was an upcharge for the laser and I'm assuming that's why you don't do all of them with lasers. You, That's you, right. You There's an extra charge. It, it's basically called a click fee. You know, to utilize the laser, they charge you for the interface. And so uh, there, there is an extra charge for the laser. And that's um, same thing. We'll talk about some of the different lenses coming up. Some of the lenses are covered and I'll tell you which ones are. And the others are the same thing. There's extra charges for the ones that, that basically if insurance considers the technology or the lens to be Cosmetic isn't the right word, but if the whole goal of that is to make the prescription less, they're not going to cover it. So they're going to cover getting the cloudy lens out and putting a clear one in. So their goal is to get rid of the glare and the halos and to get rid of the functional complaint from the cataract. So that's what's covered by this. The reason I'm asking the question is I have astigmatism also, and you mentioned that the laser can can somehow deal with astigmatism. I, I don't want to be more descriptive than that, but so that's an option you have if you use a laser, but you didn't say that you couldn't deal with astigmatism with manual. Well, yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. So, um, so low levels of astigmatism, if you have high levels of astigmatism, then you need a toric lens if you want to correct the astigmatism. And that's one of the, the, the topics we'll hit on here in a minute. And I'll kind of okay. delve into greater detail on that. Um, so, so again, the laser is a way of doing the surgery. It's a tool we can use. Um, and, and we'll talk about it in combination as we go through the lenses next. So I always tell patients you kind of have two choices. One is standard versus laser assisted. And then number two is on which type of lens and which target we use. So let's talk about the monofocal lens first. The monofocal lens is what is uh, covered by insurance. So this is a, a standard lens. This will correct myopia or hyperopia, which is near or farsightedness. It'll correct for one distance. So we can correct you for distance or we can correct you for near, but not both. Uh, this lens does not correct astigmatism and it does not help with presbyopia. So if you aim for distance, you'll absolutely need reading glasses for up close. And this is a lens that's always covered by insurance. And for people without astigmatism and that are fine without reading with reading glasses, this lens is great. I mean, it's a great lens. Um, it just doesn't correct those two things. Moving to the next option is a monofocal toric lens. So a toric lens is what corrects astigmatism. 
So monofocal torque lens will correct near or farsightedness as well as astigmatism. So if you say you're nearsighted with astigmatism, this lens will correct you uh, so that your prescriptions as minimal as possible for say distance. You'll still need reading glasses for up close. It doesn't correct you for up close, but it can optimize say the distance vision, okay? Uh, this is not covered by insurance. Torque lenses are not covered. There's an extra charge. Um, and uh, um, this is one where I say there's no real downside to doing a torque lens. If you have astigmatism, it can only help the vision. There's no side effects or anything like that from, from correcting it. So um, I really like torque lenses if someone has astigmatism. Getting back to the, the previous gentleman's question about astigmatism correction, every doctor does it a little different. The way I look at it is up to a certain level. So up to about say a diopter of astigmatism, um, a toric lens is too strong. So you can't use a toric lens if say you have 0.9 diopter of astigmatism. And that's where I find the laser to be helpful because the laser can correct about a half to a diopter of astigmatism. Um, and so that's where if there's low levels of astigmatism, I like to use the laser. Um, with more than a diopter, so say you're one and a half diopters, then you need the toric lens that, that the laser alone cannot correct that level of astigmatism. And that's where you need the toric lens. Uh, sometimes we use them in combination as well. So um, again, this is doctor dependent on how they like to do things. If someone wants to use the laser technology, I use the laser to mark where I'm going to align the lens, for instance. But again, that's that's kind of personal preference on that. But but all are good options. So that's the, the torque lens. Next, we'll move on to the Vividi and the Vividi torque lens. This is what's called an extended depth of focus lens. And so the goal of this lens is to provide distance and intermediate vision. Intermediate vision means computer or dashboard. So it's kind of a, not distance, not real close, but kind of in between. Um, it, and it also provides functional near vision. So what I tell patients with this is if you kind of hold your phone out, the goal is that you'll still be able to see it. But if you're gonna sit and read a book or spend time up close, you'll still need reading glasses but it'll decrease in your everyday life how often you need reading glasses. That's the purpose of this. Um, the reason people are real excited when this lens came out is because it really doesn't have additional side effects compared to the standard lens. And the standard lens is kind of what's considered the gold standard. Some of the older lenses that help with uh, distance and near have side effects, and we'll talk about some of those next. Um, so again, the goal of this is to give you good distance, computer, and functional near vision, uh, like we talked about a minute ago. Symptoms, uh, just to summarize this slide, it's basically showing that the symptoms of glare halos is similar between this and the standard lens. Again, ultimately, you can get side effects with any lens you put in the eye, you know, um, whether it's a standard lens or a Vividi or any other lens but um, the risk is the same as any other lens, not, not higher. This just kind of shows how the lens works. It basically has a little bubble on the front of it, which stretches the, the light is how they describe it. And it doesn't split the light. And that's the reason it doesn't have the extra side effects, but it can stretch the light. So you have a wider range of vision without glasses. This lens, uh, or the, excuse me, this slide I put in to kind of show how you can think about how these lenses work at different distances. So if you look at the first one here, this is the monofocal lens. That sign up there means infinity. So that means it, it, at pure distance. So you can see that light is nice and bright and in focus in, at infinity. But when you get down to computer range and near range, there's really not light showing up there. And that's because you'll need reading glasses to place that light in the retina at that, at that distance. The Vividi, which is the bottom one here, you can see kind of stretches out here and it gets all the distance, all the intermediate, almost into the near range. But again, for the computer computer range, uh, you'll still need, or excuse me, for the near vision, reading pill bottles, sitting and reading a novel at the beach, you'll still want some readers um, for the average patient. And then the panoptics is the Wait, one we'll talk question. about. Another, just to clarify something, there's a lot of information here, hard to jump into. And the four options from top to bottom are four different lenses. Is that right? That's right. So they are all options of the of this kind of lens, the extended focal range. Okay. So the graph shows 
the differences in. Okay, I, I got it. Yeah, so the top one is hard, the top. When you the jump top. into a slide like this without context, it's hard to start listening and reading at the same time. But, but okay. I got you. Okay, so the uh, again, the monofocal lens is, is the top line. That, that's the one that's covered by insurance. The Vividity, the one we just talked about, is on the bottom line. And then on the third one here is the panoptics, which is what we're gonna talk about next. But again, all I'm trying to illustrate, you know, I, I don't expect to, to grasp everything on this slide. This slide is designed for ophthalmologists um, who do this every day. All I'm trying to get you to see in this slide is basically how big the band of light is. So for the standard lens, you can see it covers infinity. It does not cover your near vision. The Vividity lens at the bottom here, you can see covers distance and computer. And then with the panoptics, the one we'll talk about next, stretches all the way into the near vision. Uh, and so it's just another way of illustrating what uh, those lenses cover in terms of, of field of, of vision. So how much uh, range of vision you have. And I'll, I'll summarize everything at the end as well. All right, the third one is the panoptics. The panoptics is a trifocal lens. So it's different than the Vividity lens. This lens gives you distance, computer, and reading vision. So it gives you the best chance of going without glasses at all. So for patients who say, listen, I just can't stand glasses. I don't want to wear glasses at all. This is going to be their best option. That being said, it comes with a caveat. So in order to get that distance computer in reading vision, um, it has rings on the lens. And so there is the risk of starburst or glare or starburst or halo at nighttime with driving. And so I tell patients, you know, you have to be willing to accept that if you want to do this lens. So Alcon, you know, this, these slides that I have next here, again, used by Alcon to talk about all the different distances. So this includes reading, sewing, writing, driving. Um, it really can be pretty liberating for patients if, if you're able to achieve this, but you have to know the potential side effects. So this is the first lens that, that is pretty consistently can get you those three different targets of vision. Um, in the studies, 99 plus percent of patients were happy with it and would choose it again. Um, again, very high patient satisfaction. Uh, again, this slide, again, I don't expect you to, to read everything here or um, understand all the graphs. What, it, what I'm really, again, trying to um, have you visualize is that there are some extra symptoms um, with this lens compared to the standard lens. So uh, more patients are gonna have starbursts or halos with this lens and the standard lens. And about 5% of people are fairly, you know, can be fairly significantly bothered by the starbursts or the halos. Um, and so th that's the purpose of, of, of showing this slide. I've got a question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've tried the, tr the um, I guess they're called bifocal contact lenses. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't, just couldn't adjust to them. And when I had LASIK surgery, the doctor, did the same thing. I couldn't adjust to that. So they had to change one eye so that my vision was the same in both eyes. So I ended up having two enhancements for my vision. And um, the second one kind of messed up my vision. Sure. It was like a 50-50 chance that it would happen and it happened. So how, how would these trifocal lenses work on someone like me? That's a great question. And I do hit on LASIK a little bit later. So LASIK changes everything, okay? Again, every doctor is a little different in, in what they offer and how they do things. Um, for me, to do the panoptics lens, you basically have to have a, a very healthy eye. You can't have any problems with the eye. You can't have any retina problems. You can't have any cornea problems. Um, there are doctors that put panoptics in patients that have had LASIK. Um, I do not. I do not recommend it. It, it. You know, they say you can, um, but your risk of hot, having these higher order aberrations, specifically the starbursts and the glare, mm -hmm. is going to be higher than what it is if you haven't had LASIK. And so um, the, the, the panoptics is one that I, I, I personally don't I also do LASIK. I'm a LASIK surgeon as well. So um, I counsel patients on this all the time, but um, I, I don't 
typically recommend uh, panoptics in a patient with LASIK. Um, the Vividi, um, I have had great success with the Vividi in patients with LASIK. Again, I think with that expanded range of vision, it, it, it tends to work pretty well. Again, it's patient dependent. Um, you know, depending on your cornea, if you had enhancements and there's an issue, I'd, I'd have to see specifically what, what the issues were with that. But um, there is a little more flexibility with the Vividi lens compared to the panoptics. Okay. Um, and just while we're on LASIK, I'll, I'll just hit on that for a minute. LASIK, do, LASIK or PRK, any refractive surgery, does impact your measurements for cataract surgery. And so the um, probability of hitting the target right on the head is lower in someone that has had LASIK compared to someone that hasn't. We still have good outcomes, but there is more of a risk of a refractive surprise when you've had LASIK compared to the average person. Uh, so it's just important for you to know that going in, um, uh, you know, going into it, okay? And we can talk more about that if there are questions um, as we go. All right, so back to- I have, I have one question. I, I'm not sure whether I should ask this now or, or later, but you haven't mentioned this, but how does lattice degeneration affect all of this. And if the answer is too complicated, don't worry about it. But I have later lattice degeneration. It, it hasn't gotten worse in 25 yeah. years. Sure. So, so I, lattice, de lattice degeneration would be unrelated. So lattice degeneration is a peripheral retinal uh, irregularity that can predispose you to a retinal tear, but it does not have any impact on cataract surgery. Okay. So that's not something you have to worry about. Okay. Good question. Um, so that is the panoptics. Again, this is just showing the same kind of summary about panoptics. So that kind of summarizes the different lens options. So let me just do a, a quick summary. So again, you've got the, the monofocal lens, which will correct distance or near vision. It does not correct astigmatism and does not help with both. It's one or the other. Now, one thing we didn't touch on that I, I like everyone to be aware of is something called monovision. And I think that's what um, um, the woman who just spoke alluded to is that they may have done one eye for distance, one eye for near. And just like she said, she didn't tolerate it. And so my philosophy, every doctor is a little different. My philosophy is I will not do monovision unless we try it. And so for patients that naturally have monovision, or that have worn contacts for years with monovision, uh, they're great candidates for monovision. And again, monovision is one eye for distance, one eye for near. It is different when you do it with cataract surgery than when you do contacts in Patients that are in monovision, that have never done it, uh, I, I have to see one of our so, Something's interrupting you again. There's, there's noise that blocks your speaking. I, I don't know what, I missed a lot of what you just said. The last minute and a half we cut out. Huh, okay. It, I think someone was making noise on their computer and it overrode what, it happens a lot in Zoom. Okay, um, so I'll kind of uh, touch, go back again. Um, and I, we'll start talking about monovision again. And just stop me again if you're having trouble hearing me. Um, so That's monovision is where you do one eye for distance and one eye for near. Uh, like the uh, woman had alluded to earlier, she didn't tolerate it when she did it with LASIK. And so I only offer monovision if someone tries it before surgery. And so if they naturally have monovision, or they've been wearing monovision contact lenses in the past, uh, those would be patients that would be a good fit for. Others, I would have them see our optometrist and try it with contacts before I would consider doing it. Because while some people do great with it, there are some patients that don't tolerate it well. Um, and so that is another option uh, with any of these lenses, but something that you'd have to talk about individually with your doctor about your experiences. Um, so I'll, I will pause there and see if there are any topics that you want me to hit on. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can ask a question or you can enter it in the chat, chat area. Whatever works best for you is fine with me.
I've got a question. <clears throat> I had, uh, I've had uh, eye exams every year since the fourth grade. And every year my vision changes again. So I have a new prescription and uh, I had LASIK in 2004 and it was great. I, had, I was like 2015 in my vision. Um, and then my left eye started um, getting worse again. Astigmatism was increasing. <clears throat> I right now have very small cataracts and was told that um, they would outlive me. So what do I do? Uh, what does somebody do in my situation? I, I have a pair of glasses for reading, a pair of glasses for the computer, a pair of glasses for distance. I even have a pair of progressive lenses. Sure. And am I going to have to put up with this the rest of my life because my, my cataracts are small? That's a great question. And um, there's no, uh, without having discussed specifically your case, um, first, the, the prescription changing, um, there are two things that can change in a glasses prescription. So the cornea, which is the front window of the eye, and the lens. So when we do cataract surgery, we take out the lens and we put in a piece of plastic. And so that part of the prescription won't change anymore. That stays pretty consistent. The cornea can still change, though that typically changes a lot less than the lens. And so you tend to be pretty stable afterwards, but you're absolutely right. There is a chance that over time that cornea can shift a little bit and, and, and result in a small prescription. In terms of a case like yours where the cataract's small, um, again, you have to have a functional complaint in order for your insurance to cover your, 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 uh, your, your surgery. And so what I mean yeah. by that I is- have all, I have all of those symptoms and I have really bad astigmatism. And I know you can't really answer this. Um, I have an appointment next month with, with the eye doctor, but- um, I just wondered, is it possible that someone that has a small cataract could have this surgery? Um, so yes, if you're having symptoms and the symptoms are deemed to be from the cataract, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone's a little different in how they, again, every doctor you see is gonna be different. Some doctors go by how the cataract looks, mm -hmm. others go more based on function. Uh, my philosophy is 100% based on function. And so I have patients that come in with smaller cataracts, but have significant glare, uh, you know, don't feel safe driving at night. And we do cataract surgery. And I will tell you that in my experience in patients with LASIK, um, you are more susceptible to smaller cataract changes. So um, because the cornea is no longer uh, it, it's been altered, um, you're a little higher risk of the second you start developing cataract, you can develop those symptoms earlier than someone that hasn't had LASIK. And so I would say on average, in my patients, I do cataract surgery earlier on patients with LASIK because they're symptomatic earlier. Um, but, but again, I go based on function. So I have patients that come in with small cataracts that are symptomatic and we do the surgery. I have other patients that come in with real thick cataracts but they're not bothered. And if they're not bothered, then we leave it alone. And so um, my philosophy is really based on what the patient tells me when they're coming in, as well as the exam, but the, the function and in, in the discussion really guides how, what we do. Okay, thank you. Any other questions I can answer for you today? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, can you hear me? Oh, yep, go ahead. Okay. okay, so if you have the cataract surgery and you have an astigmatism, so, and you just go with the standard lens, then presumably you're gonna still need your glasses, which is fine. But if, if you have, after you have the second eye done, um, you know, the lens put in, how soon after that will you get new prescriptive glasses so that you can see? That's a great question. So those are two things I, I did not hit on. So again, just to be clear, the standard lens is great. Uh, people do well with it. All these other lens options are strictly talking about how often you need to wear glasses. So just like you said, to, you know, do the standard lens, you have astigmatism, that's fine. You'll just need glasses afterwards. So good point on that first one. Second question you had was about when you get glasses. Again, everyone's a little different on it, but on average, I'd say three to four weeks after the second eye surgery. And so you're absolutely right. People with high astigmatism 
or that choose. So some people will choose near vision instead of distance, for instance. Patients like that, it's a little tricky for a few weeks until you get that prescription. And unfortunately, there's not a great way around it. You know, glasses are not cheap. And so um, giving you a prescription right off the bat when it's not stable isn't financially a good, good move. Um, so usually we wait three to four weeks after the surgery. Um, in a rare instance, you could do it after, say, two weeks, but for the most part, uh, three to four weeks. So does that mean that from the time you have the second eye done, you really are going to have difficulty seeing for the next month? I mean, I, 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 your current prescription is going to be too strong. Right. Typically, your current prescription won't work. Um, uh, and that, that's a good question. I would say on average, most patients that have cataract surgery are seeing well enough afterwards, even if they have astigmatism, that it's not that much different than it was before. So again, if you're having surgery, your vision's decreased. And so a, without the cloudy lens, but with the astigmatism, it's still usually functional. Um, but you're absolutely right. There, there are people that have three, four diopters of astigmatism. Um, and if that's it's not fixed. They're not going to see well until they get the glasses. And uh, there's no real way around it. Um, I haven't had that come up that many times where it was that bad that someone was concerned. Um, but in a case like that, you always have the option of doing one eye at a time, uh, waiting till three weeks after the first eye, change the lens. You don't have to get a whole new pair. Change the lens in the eye that you did first and then go ahead and do the other eye. You absolutely, you know, we're flexible. Our goal here is to help you. And so if someone has a huge prescription like that, we can absolutely space it out and get one, one lens done before the other eye is done. I mean, there, there's no uh, right or wrong. You know, we just do it on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what the patient has and what we can do to help. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, if no one has any other questions, um, you know, we're always available. You can reach out to us. We're always happy. There's, there's uh, about 25 of us doctors here at the Virginia Eye Institute, maybe a little bit more than that. We have eight locations. And so we're always available to help and answer questions as you go through this process. Um, we have more information on our website. I did another webinar of, uh, about a month ago, and there are a whole bunch of other questions. And so if you still have questions, you could see if someone else asked some of those questions as well. Um, but we're here to help you however we can, and um, hope you guys have a good rest of your day. I, I do have one more question. Um, sure. I'm, I'm not sure it's related, but I know that I have cataracts and I have astigmatism in my right eye, but the last time I got glasses, I realized that I have it in the left eye too, which I never did for many years. But <clears throat> with the last pair of glasses, I don't want to take up too much time here, but I got four pairs of glasses and you made glasses three times before and I got refractions done three times to try to nail the relationship between the two eyes. You didn't make all four pairs every time, but it took a long time, and, and I've noticed that was in February, and I've noticed now it's, what, August. I, the two eyes, if I cover one eye, uh, it's clear in the other eye, like the prescription's right, but it's the left eyes, it's clear, but it's, it's not cloudy, though. That's what I'm getting at. The right eye is perfect all the time. The left eye is perfect, but only when I'm in exactly the right place on the lens, if I'm in the mid-range area, they're progressive, all four progressive lenses. So does this sound like cataracts or does this sound like something else? It's hard for me to get the two eyes to coordinate it. It's, it's always like my glasses are on crooked or something. The two, if I cover one and cover the other, the image shifts between the two. I, I've never had this happen before. Sure. Uh, so, so a couple things. Um, a, a common thing I'll tell patients is, uh, you know, you've got some cataracts. They're kind of moderate in nature. Um, we can try the glasses and see how you do because that's the first thing you can do. And if the glasses don't fix the problem, oftentimes the next step is cataract surgery. And so if you feel like one of the eyes isn't seeing as well as you want it to, 
and the rest of the eye exam is normal, then cataract surgery would be the next step. Now, if, you know, there's things that can cause difficulty between the two eyes, whether it be a difference in a prescription between the two eyes. Obviously, there's things like double vision if the eyes aren't aligned and whatnot, and that's on a case-by-case -case basis. But typically, that is what I'll tell patients is we try the glasses. If we can't get them right, um, then it's likely that it's the cataract, and then we take care of the cataract. But again, that's on a case-by-case -case basis. I have to take but, that. But so it can be a cataract even though it's not cloudy. That's really one of my questions there. Yeah, there are patients that have cataract surgery that see perfectly fine during the day, and it's only nighttime symptoms. You know, the cataract can cause a lot of different symptoms. It's not just always blurred vision. It can be a glare. It can be light sensitivity. It can be uh, difficulty focusing. And that's where working with your doctor, you look at the cataract and in the lens and the prescription and what your experience has been, and you, you do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. And it's possible you do a sur the cataract surgery on one eye, but not the other because it's not ready and it's not a problem. Absolutely. You know, I'd say, I'd say 60, 70% of the time, we probably do both eyes, but about a third of the time, only one eye needs to be done. It just depends on the patient. Okay. All right. Thanks. I see a question here. Does the procedure ever have to be done again? So uh, cataract surgery is a one-time surgery. You take the cloudy lens out, you put the clear lens in. You may hear at some point about a secondary cataract. If you go back to my analogy of the peanut M&M, that candy shell or the capsule stays in place. Occasionally down the road, that can get cloudy and we laser that open with the laser. That's separate from cataract surgery. The laser itself only takes about three or four minutes. Um, so it is a separate thing. It's not cataracts again, um, but there, that's the only other thing you may hear if you ever hear that my cataracts came back. It's not that they came back, it's that the capsule that we left there got cloudy over time. But good question. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to wrap up here. But uh, again, thank you for joining. And if, like Dr. said, if you, Dr. Tucker said, if you have any questions, this recording will be um, on the website or you're happy to reach out to us and we're happy to help. So thank you again. Hey, Thanks for joining us. Take care. I know. Thanks for your time, doctor. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tucker.